Uh, my name's Claire Minchell. Um, I am well, I, uh, rehabilitation and conditioning specialist. I run Get Back to Sport. I also am co-director of Joint Approach. And um, I'm super passionate about bringing evidence-based um, techniques and information um, into and, and strategies into rehabilitation that, that we commonly do in sport performance, but we don't get that translation into rehab very well. Um, so that in a nutshell, that's me. That's you. Cool. <laughs> And, it, and it's good to see you. I haven't seen you for ages. Um, so, uh, yeah, since uh, I think has been, yeah. uh, must be Therapy Expo last November, I think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. How's your year been? Been OK? And even that was very. Yeah. Even that was pretty brief, wasn't it? It was a fleeting. Oh, hi, we must catch up. But obviously it doesn't happen because you're so busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, what did you say? How's my year? Yeah, how's your year been? Because I saw you, you'd, you'd um, just injured your shoulder and uh, you were, yeah, you were coming back from that. And how, how's that all been? Yeah, I'm liking your chair, by the way, Mike. Thanks. You're looking really comfy there. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> eject. Probably, eject. Probably, eject. Yeah. <laughs> it's if it all goes wrong, I've got an eject button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, was, yeah, I think. I think most people know I was um, hit by a car and had um, yeah a concussion and a, a stenocubicular joint um, surgery and uh, yes yeah, about eighty percent there maybe slightly less I think um, but I'm here which is which is amazing I no think. it's good it, it was a, a possibility that I wouldn't be so um, yeah that's 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 good so I'm, I'm by that token, I'm having an amazing year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It put, puts things into perspective yeah. when you've had something like that go on. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, anyway, enough about that. <laughs> let's um, yeah. uh, let's talk right. about what, what we're here for. So um, it's uh, it's definitely, so, I mean, obviously, I've, I've done your um, level one course and loved it. And if, uh, if anybody hasn't done it, then they've got to learn um, how to swear very loudly and... Uh, They'll, they'll know what I mean <laughs> when they come on the course. I know what I mean. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, I actually so had, uh, on, on one of the courses, um, I was saying, think about somebody that, you know, something that really gets you angry. And somebody started shouting, I think it's Sophie. And then the whole, <laughs> whole room started shouting. I was like, it's Sophie. Oh, dear. <laughs> I opened, ah! opened up a whole can of worms there for that person. Yeah, <laughs> oh, brilliant. So um, obviously, the the course that you did with us um, was all about um, all about strength training, integrating it into uh, into rehab, and um, there were some really um, there were some really key questions. And the very first question, or one of the first questions, I remember you asking. Uh, and I've seen you present and ask this as well, is what is strength? So over, over to you, what is strength? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think as I've, <laughs> as I've, I've gone on and, and done more and more of this in terms of seeing more and more people and um, teach more and more people, when I ask that question, I'm getting a lot more of a refined answer. Your clinic obviously being the exemplar um you know answer nailed it um but <laughs> um i'm getting a lot more refined answers from from people now so whereas when i started doing this course and asking that question a few years ago i'd get yeah. maybe five or six different answers all of which weren't really specific um you know things like um the ability to do activity of daily living which clearly strength is important to enable you to do that but that's not the definition and that the really important thing in getting those definitions right is so that we're working to all this towards this common and specific goal yeah so you know to be i suppose really fastidious that maximal strength is that you know maximal contractile force produced by a muscle or muscle group in a single contraction so it's what is that muscle able to produce in a, in a single very short effort yeah obviously with your own volition <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, and that's that's really important <laughs> really important to to understand because if we've got as we said different definitions we've got different ideas we're all going to be doing different things yeah um 
and you can see where the kind of conflict might come, you no know, confusion no, from definitely. then on, really. But at least, um, I, I think I, I challenge that a lot as well with um, with patients um, because uh, quite often I get people coming into clinic and they they say that they the a previous person has told them that they're weak or they're not strong. And um, and then I asked them, well, um, how, how did they test it? Well, what did they do to come to that conclusion? And quite often right. um, it's like it, um, they, oh, they, they didn't do any tests, they just felt it. And uh, I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> so uh, so you, you feel you feel someone and you feel that they're weak and that, that's such a bad message to to send to people so w what what kind yeah. of things can you do to in, in the clinic environment so you haven't got all your fancy kit um at university or whatever what what can you do in a clinic to to be able to test it yeah and i think that's a really important point mike you, you're raising there because that you know, the, the work that we're doing currently with Joint Approach, different groups of the, these individuals that have got osteoarthritis, and we're doing strength training uh, interventions with these people who have been waiting years for joint replacement surgery. But the, the point that's related to that is that the, the, the message that's delivered to them by those people that they respect and, and um, are influential in their, in their journey Mm -hmm. stays with them and that's coming through thick and fast so that being from a consultant saying you've got bone bone you need a joint replacement nothing else is going to work body body that's that's their story then so you and i think it's from your perspective where you're asking people okay how, how do they know that you're weak because mm -hmm. that's them then because i'm weak i've got weak glutes i've got i've got weak a weak disposition i don't know i've got <laughs> I, i'm weak so like how how do they know that that's it's important challenge to before you do it not you but one does it with the patient so that they can question it as, as well and think is that valid or not yeah. yeah um and also from a strength perspective what's really good is you can change it you can really change that doesn't have to be you for the rest of your life yeah if it is that you maybe not strong enough or you have some sort of disparity between sides, then you can change it. But in terms of how you assess that, um, if you don't have any dynamometry, um, I would avoid, I mean, you can do, I suppose, side to side comparisons, feeling, you know, a knee extension and you can make a judgment, a ballpark estimate of whether it feels the same left versus right. Yeah, I wouldn't be using that type of information or that that information to feed back to the patient to categorically say you're weak. Yeah, because yeah, this is fraught with 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 error and ridiculousness there. You know, to to, to label them as that, but it'll give you a, a subjective marker, which is fine. Mm -hmm. So the other thing then is you know, how do you start to evaluate the strength of the musculature? So if you don't have dynamometry, do you have a a resistance base challenge that they can do so if you haven't you know if you're doing a knee extension you haven't got a, a dynamometer or a handheld dynamometer you can fix to something or you haven't got anything that will produce a number and let me just say here just because you've got a number it doesn't mean it means anything there's a yeah. whole um <laughs> yeah, discussion around measurement science that we we need to have but maybe for another time um, can you put them in a, a, a knee extension machine? If you can do that, then can you habituate them to produce, you know, that that one rep max? Um, if you can't get a one rep max because it's painful, and oftentimes we can't get a one rep max with patients, can they do sure. a three or a five? And if you're in that three or five rep boundary, then that's a proxy marker because that's where we want to be looking to train strength. Yeah. And again, to say that. You know, when you're assessing something, you have to be as confident as you can be that you are actually doing what, what you say you're doing or they're doing what you say you're doing, which mm -hmm. is validity. And people learning the task, being habituated to the task, being maximal in that, that, that activation is so important because if they're not, then that, that number, whatever, however you've generated it, is, is useless. Yeah. Um, and let's say you've, you've done that, and that's cool. And if you don't have a... Um, a resistance-based challenge, then you're going to have to get, and as we as we move further and further away from that 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 measurement setting with with appropriate protocols and and robust um, load cells, let's say you're you're losing control 
over that situation as mm -hmm. in the controllable so the intrusion of error becomes greater but you know a proxy marker what you know something that you would expect to increase if muscle strength increased so with the joint approach patients we, we can't send out dynamometers and, <laughs> and, and information how to use them for to hundreds of patients so what we use is a a 30 second sit to stand now that's a measurement of function it's not a measurement of strength but mm -hmm. you know some of these patients um uh, uh, you know it, it depends what their, their limitation is but if somebody becomes stronger then everything becomes relatively less maximal so yeah. you know that's why endurance and performance improves with increasing strength so a long-winded answer is what do you have in terms of resources and what seems reasonable um, and challenging if they you know you're doing something for I, I don't like even 30 seconds for example that's not an assessment of, of strength so we're talking short duration high intensity stuff if you can't get do that then you can keep working back yeah yeah <laughs> what yeah. can you do now? yeah <laughs> No, and that, I don't know and that's, if that answers the, the, the question. No, de definitely. And I, I think that because that, that, that's sometimes, oftentimes the, uh, the, difficult, uh, the difficult thing because, you, you know, um, we may learn one rep maxes. Uh, we may, you know, three reps, five reps. But people, um, people struggle with it because the people that we see have got symptoms. So then the symptoms are the limiter rather than the strength being the limiter. So um, how do we then modify that activity so that we can get at least some kind of measurement? Um, but then probably longer term, because the symptoms have reduced, then that information will be less useful. But at least we've got a baseline to, to start with. And um, uh, yeah, like, exactly. like with the joint approach, um, doing the more muscular endurance type activity is a, is, is a good starting point for that population. So I think... Um, Basically, I guess what I'm saying is something is better than nothing, and and like you say, just kind of putting your finger in the air. At least you've got at least you've got something there um, to uh, to compare against. Yeah. yeah. And as long as you understand the limitations of that measurement as well, so we're never going to get in any walk of life anything that's 100% accurate 100% of the time. Yeah. It's just statistically and it's impossible. We vary as humans from from rep one to rep two on an isometric test, given full recovery, will not give exactly the same output. We won't. And there'll also be an error associated with the, the, the equipment you're using. Yeah. Um, but as long as you understand the limitations of those measurements and a place um, appropriate weighting on them, then that's fine. And like you said, you've got, a, you've got a starting point to go from. And maybe, because if you think about patients, like you just said that it's going to be a, a milieu of things that influence that that score if you're able to get a score and that will include strength it will include pain consciously kind of limiting performance and subconsciously as well relating to motor unit recruitment and inhibition and all those things naturally feed into that that measurement yeah. so as the things start to improve then you start to get an improved um score or improved output or whatever it is performance yeah yeah brilliant so yeah it's that that's you can't unless you're going to start to super maxly stimulate peripheral nerves um to, to get like evoked contractions um to measure in patient populations <laughs> yeah. um, of which we've done but it's it's not it's expensive and, and most people probably want that to happen to them yeah. um it's um you're not going to get that true biologic maximal because because of every why the reason they've come to see you right yeah yeah exactly yeah brilliant and uh, and then i guess um because obviously with, with the title today uh we're looking at strength and power so power's just for athletes though isn't it Oh, don't know whether you got Sorry, that. Yeah, that, that's you, right. You just a, a asked power. an amazing question then, and it <laughs> fell on deaf ears. Uh, so, uh, can you hear me okay? So, yes, what, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, if you can hear me all right, then, but what's the, um, uh, what's the difference then between strength and power? Okay, so it, 
broadly speaking, so strength the maximal force output of a of a muscle muscle group and a single contraction, so the highest score that you get. Broadly speaking, power is the speed of muscle force production. So how quickly can you generate an amount of force? Now I say broadly speaking because you've got different ways of which you can measure this. Now now power is actually more like the external expression of the intrinsic contractile properties of muscle. So once you, you know, so if you think about what happens physiologically to generate a muscle contraction, you've got the descending drive into the musculature, you've got um, the recruitment of motor units, you've got the synchrony of firing of motor units, uh, ideally recruitment of nearly everything that you've got or preferential recruitment of fast switch, and, and then you get the force output. <clears throat> and uh, the mustering of force quickly requires that to happen um, very quickly. So fast recruitment of fast motor units and uh, quick synchrony firing and cross-bridge cycling, etc. You're not focusing on the, the maximal force output. It's how quickly that force can be generated. So at a testing level in a laboratory type setting you're looking at the rate of force development so it would be the slope of that the gradient of that force time curve then you layer on the human if you like or the rest of the human and or the task so you it's either you know, if you think about power you've got you know jumping automatically comes to mind doesn't it yeah. so you do need good rate of force development good rapidity of force production at the intrinsic co contractile level but then you've got human on top of that or the whole body segment or maybe you're throwing something for the projectile as well so power is like the external expression of that and then when you come to a pragmatic level again so if we're talking about assessment of that what is it that you would assess um then it's most likely to be like the distance of something that's thrown or the height that somebody has jumped or the length of, of something so that would be the I suppose the external expression of, of, of a, a pragmatic uh, power test. Okay, and and how how would you how would you use that in in rehab? What what's the importance with um, with developing that um, power element in a rehab setting? So yeah, that's a it's a really important 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 point. So. Um, I always say strength first because if you know if anybody's done my my courses I, that I describe that as the fuel tank so that's your capacity so if you're training power with a very low force uh, ability then it kind of doesn't really i mean you'll get some strength of adaptation but you know it's a mute point really how quickly can you produce a very insufficient level of muscle force for mm -hmm. me it's all about generating and topping up that fuel tank get that that contractile machinery um you know the capacity of that topped right up then let you know if you want to go specific again let's train how to express that quickly yeah and if you think about how quickly injuries happen you know they they they, they happen in milliseconds tens of milliseconds um so we do need a, re a rapid force production to think about you know letting posture if you trip over you know standing up out of a chair or um, thinking in a sporting example where you uh, land and uh, maybe the foot, uh, the surface that you land on isn't quite what you expected or you're you know, trying to avoid something. We do know, need rapidity of muscle force, activation, power, rate of force development. And that's appropriate for all walks of life. Yeah. Um, so the, learning how to express that force quickly is then in, becomes important when we're thinking about fast contractions that dynamically stabilize joints and 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 the body as well so that's for me why it's it's important one of the reasons from a performance perspective then clearly you can make rationale for that as well you know have a 100 meter sprint or you know thinking about vertical jump height um in in, in basketball or, or whatever it's clearly a performance um remit but there is equally a, a remit for um, rehabilitation and maybe the avoidance of a, a second uh, injury. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, well, that that kind of brings me on to another question. Actually, I had in my notes, uh, and it was about uh, it's about the stretch shortening cycle, 
Um, so obviously with a with a jump um, type activity or a jump um, a jump test, uh, you've got a couple of different uh, jump types that you would do. Um, what what would you do differently with say your um, OA sort of 60, 70 year old um, compared to a jump athlete? Why would you choose one over the other? And can you explain a little bit about what stretch shortening cycle is? Okay, so um, it comes down, I mean, first and foremost, it comes down to how much time do you have with the, the individual that, that, that you've got and what's their starting levels of capability, capacity? And then where do they want to get to? Yeah. And those all then start to form your, I mean, you know this, Mike, but you know, the, the, you, you, you're training your rehab plan. Is it that you've mm -hmm. only got them for 12 weeks, they're really weak, and, you know, the, I, I suppose, you know, they want to be able to walk on unstable ground or they want to start to, you know, they want to go to the S&C coach and start to get back into to playing. So your remit is strength, 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 strength. In a good 12 weeks of more you know people that are chronically deconditioned you absolutely do so because as well we have um if you think about the physiologic determinants of strength and rate of performance there are there are some that are shared mm -hmm. like recruitment of fast twitch motor units like neural drive like synchrony of motor unit firing so because of that nature of you know if you're training strength true strength so that three to five rep max range you absolutely need to recruit everything you've got to accomplish that resistance challenge. Uh, so therefore, there is some development in right to force development in those individuals that are de deconditioned mm -hmm. um, following a strength training program. Yeah. So that's that's good to know. Um, but, but so from that perspective, I think, you know, the OA knee, it's very rare that you get them out of that because oftentimes it's 12 weeks. It's always 12 weeks. <laughs> So it's 12, weeks, 12 weeks. but if you're able to see them for longer then you might start to to do some other things that involve more rapid activations so you know, lower the load a little bit or make it uh inverted commas functional so if that's a, a chair stand or a step up with with extra resistance yeah. and the the goal is fast rather than as much as you can yeah um and it all it hinges on that that end goal that perform you know if it's a performance task, and it's a vertical jump athlete still are they strong enough and that, and then we can have a debate what what enough is but you know is it that they've come back off a um, I don't know maybe they've had an Achilles problem and you know that you're, you're rehabbing them following that and you know you've got to get the strength back up you've also got to condition the, the non contractile tissue as well to accommodate as well as produce you know or, or take those forces and the stretch cycling which that was a good segue in <laughs> the stretch cycling um uh, uh cycle is where you've got a well let's let's take two two jumps that like you were kind of intimating there one is a a vertical jump and one is a counter movement jump so the vertical jump is from a standing start you're in a squat position with ideally knees and hips at 90 degrees you pause there for a few seconds and then you jump up as high as you possibly can and there's various ways in which you can measure um, vertical jump height or power if you want to convert it now that's from a standing start if you consider the individual does repeats that test at this time they squat down immediately jump back up what you have is this um uh load storage uh, sorry storage of, of elastic i suppose energy and force within the within the tissues that then recoils as you start to come back up so that's why or one of the reasons why you can jump higher from a counter movement jump than you can uh from a from a squat jump um and, and whether you use these again, it, it depends on the on the application or these types of activities. It depends on the application and you know you're rehabilitating to or or what aiming for in terms of a of a end goal. Yeah, and it, would you would you choose a different method of jump depending on an injury that the person has had? So if they had more of a 
uh, um, a tendon injury, MTJ, and, and thesis or something like that? Would you change? Obviously, it's it's rehabbed and they're able to do the jumping now. But would you would you bias one jump over another to try and target certain tissues? Can you do that, or is it not possible to uh, to do it in that way? I think it, that will come down to your clinical reasoning. What is it that you need to build resilience in mm -hmm. uh, uh, and what tissues? So again, strength first, strength yep. first, strength first, get their strength into the tissues, get their tendon you know, more accommodating to, to load and less uh, tolerating of load, um, uh, become a stiffer system. Then you start to, to introduce the, the rapidity of loading and stretch shortening cycling cycles perhaps. But just a, a point on that, <clears throat> you can get the same, if not, and sometimes better, increases in vertical jump height by doing training uh, mid-thigh rack pull versus a plyometric program. Yeah. So it's not just about jumping to increase jumping. Yeah. You know, what are you doing each exercise for? So what's if you think about the strengths and limitations of resistance and, and plyometric activity, so um, let's take plyometrics. You're, you're often, um, and, and you can grade these and progress them to, to quite decent uh, intensities, but your limiting fact is your body mass or how much you feel comfortable in holding <laughs> in your hands or on your, on your, on your back in a, in a weight spare. Um, that's, that's the limiting factor. Whereas, um, so you're, you're limiting the overload, but your you know, the, the, pros of that is that your speed of or velocity of of contraction will be greater if you've yeah. got a lighter load mm -hmm. um take that to a resistance based setting where you've got this mid-thigh rack pull and to describe that you're basically in a power rack the uh there's a, an olympic bar in front of you kind of about kind of mid shin level, level and it's weighted uh, anywhere between i don't know 50 to 70 percent of you you want rep max your aim is to um, lift that up to mid thigh as quickly as possible. So it's an explosive activation. It, yeah. it includes all of the posterior chain, all the lower or lower limb segments, and the the feet. The aim is feet off the floor. What happens generally because it's, it's it's too heavy. Yeah. But you can see already you're able to overload the system a lot more versus body mass so whilst you're not jumping what you are doing is developing explosive force production in all the musculature that contributes to vertical jump height yeah so that so in, what's, in, the, what's intention. the goal is it yeah is it yeah. that 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 intention to jump is really key absolutely yeah 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 you're right you know the one of the or the fundamental difference between and we talk about this in the 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 power coach um i've just enrolled to um the fundamental difference between training for strength and training for power is exactly what you said it's the intention to be explosive mm. now whether or not that what you see externally looks fast will clearly be limited by how much mass you're trying to shift yeah. but that doesn't matter it's not a strength effort where you're just grinding it out and it takes three seconds and you know it doesn't really matter no the intention is to be explosive yeah and that really is a useful cue, a really useful cue uh, for people to, to, you know, enhance that explosive force production. Yeah, brilliant. And um, I think one of the one of the things that was really really stuck in my mind after the session we did with you was, um, and you've mentioned it already, is uh, about um, how we get that information from from the brain um, through to the muscles that you want to activate. And, and that EMD, uh, that electromechanical delay, and that being one of the key um, key issues with with injury. See, I did learn something, so <laughs> so um, I was I was definitely listening. I'm uh, the best, Mike. <laughs> So, uh, did, could, could you? Um, you should be talking about this, not me. <laughs> Don't do that to me. Uh, yeah, do, do you want to explain a little bit more about that? Because I, I thought that was one of the key uh, key things about about injury rehab and and how strength training can play a part. Sure. So, if we think about, if we take what happens at the muscle site, so um, we're forgetting information processing. 
Are you you're responding to a queue of some sort that that's threatening? We're forgetting the transmission of the signal through the peripheral and uh, central and peripheral nervous system. We're at the muscle site now where we've received instruction that that muscle needs to contract mm -hmm. bloody fast, <laughs> right, let's say, and strong. So, so inherent with every skeletal muscle is this delay time. There's a time delay between the electrical activity commencing in the musculature, which we're able to detect through surface electromyography, um, and the initiation of, of force production. So that's very, you know, it's, it's a minuscule amount. It's just initiation of force. It's not meaningful yet, but it, it shows that there's a, the, the force has started be, to be produced. And there's a delay, there's a lag time there. And as I said, that happens in every skeletal muscle. And the importance of this, so, you know, a, a good, inverted commas, delay, or a quick delay in, in, let's say, recreational athletes for the quads might be something like 30 milliseconds. Now, if it takes around about 300 milliseconds to blink your eye, then you're probably going, what's the, what's the point in thinking about this? It's just so small. Yeah. Well, it is really important because actually, let's think of a couple of rationales. One, we look at ultra high speed filming of ACL injuries um, in handball. Um, it might take between 40 to 80 milliseconds from the point of foot contact on the floor to, you know, pop goes the ACL. So that's pretty quick. Yeah. Now, there's a lot going on there, but but like, just illustrates the, the, the point of time and temporal matters being important. Um, the other thing to say is this delay is hugely changeable. I mean, hugely changeable. So following, let's take ACL injury, for example, um, I've seen that delay increase to 150 plus milliseconds um, with ACL injury, with other injury, even with muscle damage. So you've got that that um, sore feeling a couple of days after you've done some novel exercise that can really influence the the speed of muscle force mm. initiation as well yeah. so this things get gets really really long can do um but by the same token we can train it to get shorter and that's a part of that explosive force production it becomes very very difficult to disentangle that from from force production in a, in a standard clinical setting, unless you have, and this is where you need, you know, excellent dynamometry and you need electromyographic um, systems and you need them to integrate and have, um, you know, kind of phase like between processes of the processing of signals, mm -hmm. you, something that you, you can't really measure, but it still happens. And being cognizant of that is really important and it will develop with this explosive force production. So the majority under most circumstances, a majority of that delay is due to the slack and the compliance in the tissues and non-contractile tissues in series with muscles. So that's like the tendon, the tendon aponeurosis. Mm -hmm. So if you have a very deconditioned tendon, then you're reeling in all that compliance before you start to pull on, you know, to, to initiate force production and then the force production kind of being passed to bone uh, for movement. Yeah. Um, if you have a much stiffer tendon, tendon stiff systems are great you know stiff system you've got very little compliance to reel in um so that happens quick more quickly the component is that fast twitch motor unit activation and, and synchrony of firing so if you're deconditioned or let's let's just take endurance athletes and older people versus um younger people who maybe are sprint athletes mm -hmm. there's a difference in profiles of this this delay between the two because you know, endurance much slower the train more the slow twitch motor units versus kind of uh, speed athletes train more speed <laughs> it makes yeah. sense yeah yeah and as we decondition we preferentially lose capacity of that fast twitch motor unit capacity so therefore one of the changes that we see is that electromechanical delay um getting longer but it's changeable you know it's mm -hmm. changeable that's a good yeah. thing yeah brilliant and uh, if um so but we what would you um let, let's say it's uh it is someone that's um in their older years um they're worried about tripping maybe they've done it before uh worried about doing it again how what how would you progress them into those more powerful activities what what would um i mean obviously it's you know 
it's going to be variable and and you say you say it depends and of course it depends but um in your mind what what's your kind of uh, general progression that you would do with you know, who's in her 70s who's, who's had a bit of a fall so again focusing on strength and um increasing that as much as we possibly can and that might take a while for somebody to get into that that mindset of doing things that are quite challenging and, and heavy yeah um and getting the confidence to do that uh, concomitant side of that then you know these people if we're taking this type of profile oftentimes their balance is, is you know the proprioception sensory motor performance is, is quite poor as well so you might find that a single leg balance task is really really challenging yeah so we'd i'd probably do the the, the two not at the same time, but kind of separated out um, and look to improve those. Then if you're thinking down the line, if or if you've got somebody who's a little bit more capable, more uh, steady, you can push on a bit further. I'd be, you know, if you think maybe a fall occurs as somebody's getting up out of a chair. Yeah. A progression of a um, an exercise to... In a control situation, trying to elicit explosive force production, and it's relative, right? It's relative to that person, might be a step forward. As they lean forward, they're changing the center of mass and they just need to quickly step forward. Okay. It's not very frightening, it's not very challenging, and that's something you can progress. Um, and then it might be a couple of steps. And then you might be able to work up from that to initiation of a little bit of a jump, two footed jump, find a banister. And you can progress on from that and then may, or maybe a step off the bottom stair. And a lot of this, I think, is about confidence, too, um, as well as, you know, when you're saying before about, about pain and, and we're talking about inhibition, it's it's, you know, we've lost that capacity if we do nothing about it, preferentially to fast twitch motor units. So if we've got high velocity muscle contractions at a low intensity, actually that is a pre there's a preferential or greater recruitment from that fast twitch capacity. And that's what we're trying to build. So get the foundations in strength built first. Think about what it is that's going to um, have greatest efficacy in, in, in stability work that doesn't feel threatening and challenging and is doable. And then from that, where can you progress to? And it doesn't have to be really complicated or, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of uh, scary for them you know that step forward at, you know is, is something that could be quite efficacious and then you're thinking about well can we get them with a, a loaded backpack and you know th there's all manner of places you can go with it yeah yeah i've, I've got a um a lady that i i see and we've been working on this quite a lot and uh, we use a waitrose uh carrier bag and uh, <laughs> yes. uh, lo unilateral loading uh, with, with uh, um, s stepping over objects and doing little little like um, quick steps, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, try try to make it like she's at the shops, and then she trips over a paving slab. You know, is that, is that that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to recreate? Uh, but well, I've been it's taken a while yeah, to, get, exactly. to get her to that to that point. But. Uh, we, you can tell we're we're posh round where we come from, yeah. Leslie. We 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 got waitrose, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I've just had a couple of people make some comments. So uh, Leslie Campbell uh, said, "Trying to get my eighty-six-year-old mother to do exercise is bad for her blood pressure." <laughs> yeah, bad for her <laughs> mother's blood pressure or hers. Uh, and uh, Alistair uh, Cunningham from uh, up in Liverpool. There, Lo love that delay is highly changeable. I've got a dance sports day 100 meter race next year um and obviously cannot disappoint the kids you need to start training now al for that one um and, uh, <laughs> they get very competitive don't they? Yeah. Uh, so em said that's such a great question uh constantly trying to keep things interesting with my older less steady clients so thank you thank you um yeah and if anybody else has got any questions just pop pop them through um that would be great so i'm uh, conscious of time because obviously we we started a little bit later so uh um, we'll, we'll have to um, finish, uh, shorten it a little bit, but um, yeah, we, we've got. Um, uh, I've got on my list of questions as well um, a bit about program design. 
So um, another thing that I remember you talking about, which was really useful again, was um, about where where the heck do you start? So you know, you've never prescribed exercises before. You're not really sure what to do. Um, you've create you've worked out what someone's let's say ten rep max is, so we can get them going on an endurance program. Um, but um, how many exercises do you do? How many sets? How many reps? Um, how do you choose all that stuff? Uh, and, and again, I know it's it's very um, the the kind of answer is it depends. But um, have you got a bit of a kind of structure of of how you would you would start people and then progress people through? What what kind of things would you be uh, would you be looking at there? Um, it's it really de- it does really depend on that person. I have to have to say that, don't I? Uh, but how you know understand what what's going to get done right that's the first thing so it's pointless going I've got the best program in the world and none of it gets done because they hate it or for some reason that you've not bothered to or had the chance to ask them about so that's the first thing is getting that report sometimes it's super easy really really easy brilliant they've come to you for a reason they're already go let's say to the gym it's fab that's just easy as if it's somebody that that hasn't like take your um a lady that you were describing there who is is fall um is prone to falling then i would hazard a guess that she's not a regular gym goer and there's that huge buy-in period at the start so that first interaction with with patients you know i honestly don't care what do <laughs> yeah. to a point in that first session I just want them to come back for a second and and start that change in behavior mm-hmm. um clearly I care I care but I don't care if I don't get exactly everything done that I want to get done because you know some for some people too many exercises and that might be three is is that's the difference at that that point in time of, of doing some and none so it might it's to understand what they feel comfortable with, how knowing how much you can push them, and that comes with experience. Yeah. Uh, and there's no formula for that. I, you know, I work with a psychologist, and you know, there's there's several strategies you can use. Ultimately, you know, there isn't a, a set formula because we're all individual, unique, and and that's a fabulous thing. Um, but ultimately, what if if as I said, strength first, then then power or rate of force development. I'd be, you know, to opt, optimize that interaction, um, that programming would be focused on achieving a minimal dose of repetitions per muscle group per week in my view. And again, in the courses that, you know, obviously the one that, that we did at your clinic and the strength and, for, and um, strength and conditioning for therapists online, we talk very much about this dose response. What's the minimal dose that you could give somebody to elicit a a physiologic effect over a period of time and i've worked that out to be around about 25 to 45 repetitions per muscle group per week Mm -hmm. at that five rep max intensity so it has to be high intensity and again it's going to take people some people a longer time to get to feel confident and comfortable at pushing that intensity with the clinical population you need to find ways in which to adapt the exercise not lower the load to account yeah. for symptoms do you go full range do you go isometric do you go eccentric do you go open kinetic chain or closed kinetic chain? there's a multitude of ways you can adapt exercise to maintain specificity without compromising on the, the, the load and um and that you know stimulus that you want to develop so that would be what i'd would aim for and then look around you what what have you got <clears throat> logistically to be able to do that for for that particular muscle group if you if you've got a lot of kit around you and uh they're you know habitual gym goers that's perfect you can probably give them something they're able to complete on their own time uh if it's somebody that's less familiar i'd start with machine-based exercises if you're able or at least then downgrade some of the complexity of, of the exercise challenge in the first instance mm-hmm. to again make make sure they feel confident comfortable and you can elicit that overload so leg extensions or knee extensions to be precise they're fa- fantastic you know any machine-based exercise is fantastic you can load people up and they're very safe but if you don't have that 
Um, you can work isometrically. You can generate stuff um, very easily to work isometrically. But then it will come into probably if you've got a um, dumbbells or you've got an Olympic bike, it can become compound quite quickly. Mm -hmm. How do you downgrade that challenge to make it feel less safe? So you wouldn't start somebody on who's never gone to the gym before on a barbell back squat and turn them into an inverted pendulum. <laughs> and you go, oh, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Um, but what you can do is, you know, if you're still working the lower components, uh, you know, are you picking something off, up off the floor? The disaster happens, you just let go. It's, yeah. it's that easy, you know? Yeah. So just thinking about the complexity of that exercise, yeah. that, that critical dose. I, don't, I like what you said there. No, I'm, um, correct me if I if I misheard it, but um, the uh, it's the intensity that's the key. So you try to adapt the exercise to maintain that intensity, um, so that that adaptation occurs. Is that right? So you wouldn't want to get them on like a yellow theraband doing hundred reps. You'd rather do them like heavy isometrics rather than going full full range for that strength gain. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because if you move away from that hindsight, you've changed the stimulus and you're not doing what you said you were doing, you do. You've identified in that instance that strength is important. The first thing people think about when they go, oh, no, it hurts when I do that. Um, clinically, it's fine, but oh, no, no, it hurts there. Okay, let's lower the load so it doesn't hurt so much. Hang on a minute. Why? 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 Why have you lowered the load? Yeah. If they need to get stronger. Lowering the load is going to compromise that interaction, compromise that stimulus and adaptation. What can you do before you lower the load to keep that specificity and that, and that high intensity? Yeah, brilliant. Notice I've gone a little bit dark here. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that's, uh, that's great. Yeah, and the isometrics are great for that in that early stage. Um, because they're, they're in control of that. It's nice Absolutely. and safe. They can change the angle. And um, yeah, that, and we've got a really cool piece of kit. We've got one, one of the lads in my clinic is doing a SNC degree. And um, he's got um, one of those, um, it's a, like a pull dynamometer. So it's an Exergo, I think it's called. And uh, you, you can... Um, uh, you can hook it up to just a, a fixed object and, and just pull it as hard as you can and it will give you a readout. And uh, yeah. so we, we can get really, really good estimates of uh, of one rep max. Well, we can get one rep maxes but because they can just pull as hard as they can and they're not yeah. going to go anywhere. Um, so, so something like that is 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 really really cool. Um, it's a great it's a great bit of kit. They're, they're pretty. They're, well, they're not hugely expensive. They're a couple of hundred quid. But the the kind of information that you get from it um, is it helps just set up that program for, from the beginning. And it's been really really useful. So, um, uh, as well as the the handheld dynamometers um, that yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you you talk about. And that about also. For. I was just saying that delay, forgive me. I was just saying as well, with that with that um, numeric as well, um, it gives you a marker of, of the forces that they're outputting as well and gives them a goal. So it, you can use it for a testing situation. And with a different application, you can use it for a training situation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you get somebody to push, push maximally, you need them to push maximally, um, and you just, um, you just have to rely that's going to happen, don't you? Yeah. If you've got a, a number that you can see, most people will respond positively to that. Um, so it would be a good motivational tool as well. No, definitely, definitely. And um, I've, I've just realised it's just sneaked past nine o'clock. So uh, uh, we're, we're going to expect a 2,000-word uh, a essay from everybody about the differences between strength and power uh, on, on your desk by next Monday. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not marking them. <laughs> Uh, Claire, thank you very much for uh, for joining us. And uh, apologies about the beginning, um, but we did get to chat in the end, and it was really, really good. Uh, really enjoyed that. Flew by. It was great. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Nice to see you again. It's been a, a long time. Uh, I expect to be in therapy um, expo again when we see each other for sure. Probably. Well, definitely there. Hopefully before. All right. You take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the questions.